Welcome back to season three of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. But if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season has been focused on interviewing people who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. If that sounds like you, reach out. We can talk about having you on the show, too. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. This is what keeps the show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal. You can find the links to either option in the podcast description. As always, a portion of the proceeds do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. My name is Amanda Blackwood. As always, I am your host. With me today, I have a fascinating man who has an incredible story that I think that you guys are going to get a lot of value out of. Um, He's uh, got quite the history. I'm going to let him tell the story because only he knows it the way he does. Um, But I think you're going to really like this guy. Uh, Welcome to the show, John Jarman. Thank you, Amanda. I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm honored to be a guest. So... I'm excited to have you. I, I love your story of redemption. Um, it's, it's a very powerful message. I think a lot of people need that in their lives right now. Um, just to preface this, you and I are both Christians. So some of the topics are going to be on uh, uh, Christian faith and how we came to that faith, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, so start this out for us. Tell us where you're originally from. Where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Arkansas. And then at age five, I moved to, to Washington. My dad was in the Air Force. So we, he was stationed at Fort Lewis out here. Um, and so then I spent the rest of my uh, childhood and, and early adult life here until I joined the Marine Corps. Um, I lived in a city, rent in Washington. And uh, that's where I graduated high school from. And I stayed around until I was about t- age 23. Um, and you know, that's where my story kind of begins. Cause, um, my dad was a very abusive alcoholic and, and there was a lot of abuse in my family and, and trauma. I don't really have a lot of memory up until age 12. Um, and then when he left, you know, it was my mom and my three brothers trying to survive. And so, you know, in the eighties, I got mixed up in the drugs and started selling drugs cause I could make more money doing that than working at McDonald's at the time. Oh, yeah. And, um, <laughs> So, you know, I'm not proud of that, but it, but it was a way to survive. And, um, right. you know, I did that up until age 23 and I was sitting in a, at a party on New Year's Eve of 1987. And I looked around and I said, there's got to be more to life than this. And two days later, I walked into a Marine recruiting office and I said, hey, how fast can you get me out of here? And the recruiter said, did you commit a crime? And I'm like, yes, but I've never been caught. <laughs> and <laughs> he, uh, he, we talked for another probably two hours and two months later, I was standing on the yellow footprints in San Diego, starting my Marine Corps career. And it was the best thing I did. Cause it, it saved, that probably saved my life. If I would have stayed where I was, I probably would have been dead or in jail. So. That is amazing, John. And thank you for serving our country. I love thank the you. Marines. Uh, my husband was in the Navy and okay. my father was in the air force. Okay. Uh, so I'm there with you, but I have to ask what part of Arkansas? Uh, I was born in Fort Smith. Okay. And I would, I would go back there from time to time to see my grandmother. And, you know, the, it's, it's funny because when I grew up, we didn't grow, I didn't grow up in a church, obviously, with what I just explained. Right. Um, and I, when I'd see my grandmother, when we'd go back to visit her, she would, she would say the same thing to me every time she saw me. She would say, Johnny, God's got something special planned for you. Aww. And when this book, when, when I got signed to the publisher and, and I held the book in my hand for the first time, I know my grandmother it was in heaven smiling down upon me because she was like, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> you bet she was, man. Yep. Those Arkansas so, grandmas. <laughs> well, and, and you know, I, th- I think that's the power of prayer because, you know, even though I didn't know Christ and we didn't know Christ, my grandmother was praying over myself and my three brothers her whole life. And, you know, it, that's the only answer for that. So that's amazing. My, my son is in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my mom's entire family was from North Little Rock. Okay. So. As soon as you said Arkansas, my ears perked up. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, little little Fort Smith, Arkansas. So yeah, Fort Smith is a neat area. I, yeah, I, it is. My favorite grandmother. Um, I shouldn't say that. I had three different grandmothers, but she really was my favorite. Secretly, uh, she was an Arkansas lady. She okay. was amazing. Yeah, uh, there's something about those Arkansas grandmas. So joining the Marines. 
Yep. It sounds like that was a really great point for you to kind of turn things around. You said it saved your life and kind of gave you a new direction. Had you, did you feel at that point, like you had already moved past all of the stuff or were you just finding a new uh, channel? You know, it, it, that decision, when I walked out of the party, I'd never used drugs again. It was, it was that wow. easy for me. And, and, you know, I looking back on it now with the faith that I have, that was God's intervention. Yes, it um, was. You know, and so, you know, when I got to, when, and that's the Marine Corps is where I first heard about God because the drone instructors came in on Saturday night and said, if you guys want an hour break from us, you can go to church service tomorrow. And I went, I raised my hand because I wanted a break from the drone instructor, <laughs> not because I wanted to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that, that was probably where the seed was planted. Although it, you know, it didn't get watered until probably, you know, it, well, I said just got continually watered until, you know, I completely surrendered in 2016. So. Wow. So That's amazing. Yeah, because after the, after the Marine Corps, I, I went to I moved back to Ohio with my then um, fiance, who would be my wife of nine years, and I went to Ohio University and I got a master's in physical education, and athletic administration, so I could coach football, and I did it because I I did I wanted to help kids not do what I did, and um, so that that was a way to do that. Um, and you know, I started getting involved in fellowship of Christian athletes, and so I continued my faith continued to grow, um, but as we all know. If you're not completely walking, you're going to stumble and you're going to have hard times. And, and my biggest thing is I didn't want to give up control because I was a control freak. I controlled my life since age 12. <laughs> well, I mean, age 12. And then I became a Marine. OK, and then I was a football coach. So that didn't help things. <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, that was the biggest thing, I, you know, as I was in my early walk and, and uh, up until I met my mentor, um, it was, you know, I still wanted things John's way. I still wanted things in John's timing. And obviously we know that that doesn't work. Um, and so those were some of the things I had to give up later. And, and we'll talk about that a little later. But, um, you know, I started coaching. I moved moved all around to, you know, I was in Ohio, North Carolina, Georgia. And then I moved back. My dad passed away in 2003. And I that Christmas I came home to visit my mom. And she was really ill. And so I said, I got to come back home. And it, I'd been gone for 18 years. And so I moved back to Washington and um, st I started coaching up here, but I only coached a couple of years and I, cause I was burned out and I got out of it. And then I went into the personal training business cause I still wanted to use my degree and train people. Um, and then I lost my mom in 2008 um, mm. to, to congestive heart failure. And so, you know, I was doing the personal training gig and, and then we, my company I was working for got bought out. I opened up my own training studio. Um, and so I had my own company and, um, and then 10 years ago, I, I lost my second oldest brother. Six years ago, I lost my oldest brother. Um, and Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, it's, it, you know, it, it, tough, yes. But, you know, the, we all did drugs. And I think their deaths were a result of, of them not getting out of the situation. Um, or, or it was a direct cause of them using drugs. I would say that. So, um, yeah. And so... Um, and it was that time, you know, that I kind of realized my self-destructive behavior because I would, you know, I would go to schools and I would turn them around and then I would do something to trip myself up and cause me to have to move around. Um, and I saw that happening again and I saw counseling then. Um, and by the grace of God, the third counseling office I called was Christina Holland and she was taking patients and Christina and I have worked together off and on for 10 years. Um, I, I haven't visited her since about 2018 because our work was complete. I was free of all my past and all the shame and guilt had been lifted and, and her and Scotty Kessler, my spiritual mentor were the reasons for that. So, cause I met Scotty shortly after I started working with her. So. Wow. So I, I know that you had mentioned in the, the correspondence we had previously uh, that the trauma in your life put an armor on you that wouldn't let anybody get close to you. And it made you yep. really selfish and it gave you a temper. How long did it take for you through the counseling to be able to work through that stuff so that you could calm the temper and, and learn to have empathy for others and not be selfish? Well, the, the counseling created a vulnerability in me. It, it created, it, I, I learned how to become vulnerable and set down some of my pride, but I have to say it was, it was the complete surrendering to God and the work I did with Scotty. I started working with Scotty probably 2015 or no, sorry, about 2012. And on November 16th of 2016 is when I truly fell to my knees and gave up control of my life to God. 
Um, so it was, it was that work that did it um, because that's when I started seeing the temperament calm down because um, it was still there. Um, you know, and I, I use an analogy in the book. I talk about, you know, Christ and God chose the crucif crucifixion for, for multiple reasons, I think. But one of the things that resonates with me is crucifixion is a long, slow and painful death. And I think that symbolizes our old self. It's going to be a long and painful process to get rid of that old self. And so it takes some time in some people, especially if you've been a victim of trauma or something like that, it's going to take a little extra long and it's going to be, it's going to be some hard work and it, it'll be a little painful. So, but I think, you know, God, God gets you through it. So. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it goes back to what your grandma said. Yep. You know, yep. God has a purpose. He yep. has a plan. And yep. all we got to do is just get through the bad stuff and figure out how to follow him. Well, yeah. And, and I think the vulnerable for men, and this is, I'm going to direct this to you, the males and, that are listening, is is the pride and ego that we have sometimes is is unbelievable. And, and we need to lay down the pride. We need to humble ourselves and we need to become vulnerable. Um, and that's the only way you're going to remove the veil so that you can truly see God in your life and understand what God's word is speaking to you. Because the word, the word speaks to me so much differently now than it did six years ago. Um, and it's so much clearer, clearer because, because the veil has been removed. So that's awesome. And I don't get too many opportunities to talk about my husband very often on this mm -hmm. podcast, but this is a perfect opportunity for me. He is one of those people who learned how to put his pride and mm -hmm. um, all of that aside. Um, his mother sacrificed a lot when he was a kid growing up so that he could go to a very small Christian school. Mm -hmm. um, so he grew up in faith. I did not. Right. So when we met, it was only a few months after I had been baptized. It was. Oh, okay. I was baptized in April. We met in July. Oh, wow. Okay. So he has helped me so much on my spiritual journey, but mm -hmm. I, he mm -hmm. wouldn't have been able to do that if he wasn't one of those people like you who learned to take his traumas and, and work through them and learn how to be that communicator and learn how to work through it with God and yeah. learn how mm -hmm. to relinquish that control. It's so important for men to understand how this is beneficial, not just for themselves, but in the relationships in their lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when you when you do become vulnerable, when you give up that control, you start to see the evidence of God in your life. And then it makes it a lot easier, you know, because, it, you know, I used to say it's a coincidence. Now I say it's a God thing. Um, and so because I don't believe in coincidence, it's it's there, there. There was a plan and certain things happen for a reason. And so it's a, it's an amazing. And then, you know, obedience is another thing, because until you've become vulnerable and given up control. I don't think you can hear God's voice as well as you should. And then you start hearing his voice. And, and when you start following what he says to do, then your life really changes. So. Yes, absolutely. Do you, do you remember that moment where you finally said, okay, this is real. This is where I'm going and I'm going to follow God. Absolutely. It's November 16th, 2016. It was 3.30 in the morning on my living room floor. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was, it, and here's the thing, that was my, that was my true re rebirth. Um, and it was, I was going through a tough time. Um, a, a young lady I was dating for four years, we, we it was a true Christian relationship. Um, her children really didn't know accept me. And so we ended up after four years breaking up, my business was struggling. My younger brother's wife was in the hospital and she was basically on her last legs dying. And I had all this stuff just crumbling around me. And I, I just fell down that morning and I started praying and I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I'm giving my, you are in control. I'm not going to try to control anything else. You've got it. And then I opened up the Bible. I just picked it up and I opened it up and it opened up to first John five, five through 10. And I'm going to paraphrase here in this verse, but it says, God is the light. There is no darkness in him. And if we keep walking in the dark, then we do not have fellowship with him. And when I read that, I said, I have to change my life because that's what I was doing. I claimed to have a relationship, but I was still walking some of my dark past. And that's when I made the change because I read that verse right there. That was in, in five through 10 and a couple other verses. But um, that was really what did it. So. And that brings tears to my eyes. I remember coming across that myself. 
um, in some of the darkest times of my life and, and realizing that, you know, I might be in this dark place, but God is not a dark place. And if I follow him right. and do what it is that he's asking me to do, I will survive this. I will have that peace and I will be able to move on from everything. Yep. Yes, ma'am. And, and, you know, when you, when you obey what God tells you to, and I'll share this story, this is one of my favorite stories about my book. Um, because on February of 2021, I was reading in the morning and I came across Hebrews 10 36. And it says, when you, when you're um, doing the will of God, you must persevere to get what he reward or what he promised. And then later that morning I was working out and I was reading out of one of my favorite author, AJ Swoboda's very first book, Messy. And he was talking about the will of God. And he said, no one told him if anybody would buy his book or read his book. He just was told he had to write it. So those two things happened within about an hour. And I went, okay, I got to finish my book. I started in 2014. It's now 2021. It was February. I was, I, I finished the book in four weeks. I got hooked up with an editor who was used to be in prayer ministry with my um, spiritual mentor. She turns out to be a scout from Morgan James Publishing. They signed me in September. I had the first copies of my book in March of last year. Now, because of my obedience, God took care of everything else and made it happen that quick. Wow. And what's your book called? My book is, uh, title of my book is Broken and Redeemed, Finding Freedom Through Complete Surrender. And it, it is just groundbreaking. Yeah. I love the way that God was able to move in your life. I, oh, it's just, and, and that's, I tell people, I said, you know, after seeing that, how can I doubt? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like Paul, when he saw Jesus walking on the water, if I was saw that, I, I, how do you doubt this man anymore? Know what I mean? <laughs> right, right, so, absolutely. You know, so, so who inspires you the most? Well, I'd have to say, if spiritually, it's it's Scotty Kessler, my my mentor. So Scotty's been doing spiritual ministry for years and years and years. He probably has about fifteen hundred disciples, um, and he's just he is a super strong man of God, and um, his obedience and and his lessons have just that's it's changed my life and it's saved me. So. That's very cool. Do you have any favorite authors in the same genre? Well, yeah, AJ Soboda, one I just mentioned. I, lo I love mm -hmm. AJ's writing. He's a doctor of theology up here in Oregon. Um, and then I love reading to A.W. Tozer. Um, he's a little bit heavier. Um, and, you know, obviously C.S. Lewis is, is right in there. But those are probably the three um, that I truly, really like. Very cool. I, I think I can hear a little bit of their inspiration in uh, what I have read of your writing too. Yeah, I use, I use some quotes of theirs a lot in the book and, and, you know, it's funny cause I had somebody ask me, um, you know, how did I know when to put the Bible verses into the text of the book or those quotes? And I said, it just came to me. I said, I was writing and all of a sudden I'd be like, Oh, this verse would be perfect here. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And I said, it was, the, it was, you know, I'd pray before I read or write and I'd write two hours every morning and it was just a spiritual dump. And it was funny because Arlen, my, my publisher, goes, John, who's your target audience? And I said, Arlen, I don't know. I just wrote. I didn't think about a target audience. I was just writing what God told me to put on the paper. And I said, my book's for anybody. And she goes, well, you really can't say that. And then she did the review, her first read through the book. And she wrote back in, in her review and she said, OK, I usually don't say this, but your book is for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the cool part of the book is, is I, I, being a teacher, um, I wanted people to, I wanted to people, I wanted to kind of challenge some people on where their faith walk is. And, and if you're new to Christ, the, the, so I put questions at the end of the chapter to challenge you and to kind of measure where you're at in your faith. And if you're coming to Christ, they'll help you grow in faith. And so the book, you know, it's, it's designed, it could be a, study guide you know you could do a 15 week study with some group of friends and or you can just read through the book and then go back and do the questions afterwards and, and i think that's really been an impact um and the the book has had tremendous impact i have a young lady who was a couple years behind me in high school she saw that i wrote a book and she got it on kindle and then she reached out to me through facebook and she said john i just want you to know I saw your book. I found it. I read it. And if, had I not found it, I was about to kill myself. Oh my so gosh. she was, she was going to kill commit suicide and my book saved her. And so she's been walking with the Lord for the last four months. Oh, that's amazing. Yep. Yep. And I mean, it's just strong and it's just, it, you know, when I read her, her I, message at Facebook, I was 
crying because I was like, the book saved somebody's life. And that's what it was, you know, that's what people used to ask me, what do you want out of the book? And I said, I want to bring one person to Christ. If I do, that's great. You know, I never thought it would save somebody's life, though. So sorry about that. Yeah, I I had a similar experience with my autobiography. So I, I'd been uh, putting it off for many years. God kept on telling me, write your book, write your book, write your book. And I said, no, oh, I've got this other one that I'm going to write first. And I'm going to do this one first. I'm not comfortable with that one yet. I can't tell that story yet. Right. And finally, when he said it one more time, he practically screamed it at me. Um, right. I sat down in December of 2020 to write my book, wrote the entire book in the single month. Um, and then it was published on my 10 year anniversary of freedom from trafficking and my entire life just changed. Yep. I had See, people writing to me. That's because yeah. you obeyed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it took me forever to get there. Yep. It took me several yep. years, yep. but I finally yep. obeyed. And the final page of the book is actually a picture of my baptism. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of a fun way to end yeah. the book. And yeah. I had no idea that was going to happen when I started right. writing it. So, yeah. so Christina Holland, my counselor back in 2014, she's the one that speared the book. Cause she said, John, you need to write a book. And I kind of chuckled at her. And then I <laughs> told a few friends and they're like, yeah, John, you need to write a book. And so the, the, the coolest part of my book, I should say, or, or the neatest story I think in the book is um, I use uh, mercy me, their yes. song, the, the song, dear younger me is the title of my last chapter. Um, because when that song was released, it just spoke to me. And, and I was like, I want to know what made Bart write this song. Yes. And God made it happen. Bart and I sat backstage and in a, when they played up here in Kent, because I bought backstage passes, um, we went backstage and their road manager, I told them what I wanted to do. And he, Bart came in and we sat and shared testimony for probably 30 minutes before the concert. He gave me permission to use the song. And so that's, that's the, it, last chapter of my book it's called my uh, dear younger me and i kind of go through the song and tell tell you know my first take of the song and then i write a letter to my dear younger self and so that that's a pretty cool part of the book oh that is so cool i was going to ask about you meeting uh, uh bart and going yeah. to mercy yeah. me that's that is really amazing and i mean that's a god thing because it, it i was dating leah at the time and, you know, it was her, her birthday was coming up. And so I bought the tickets because they were going to sing. The, part of the ticket package was they'd sing happy birthday to her. Oh. And so the group that sang happy birthday, the warm up act that sang happy birthday to her was a was a worship team from a church that in Chicago. Lee and I listened to the pastor on a podcast every day, every day. And then we you know talk about it and stuff. So that's a there's a God thing. And so when we went backstage, I told them, you know, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. And they introduced me to the road manager and then the rest is history. And, you know, Bart and then, you know, a couple of years later, I can only imagine comes out. It's the movie about Bart's life. And I'm watching this movie and I'm like, he just he just he sat back on stage and told me this whole story, you know, because his childhood and my childhood are a lot alike. So Wow. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I, yeah. Have you seen amazing. the movie? I have not. Yeah, I it's so a, want it's a, to. Yeah, it's an it's a great movie, and and it was kind of neat to sit there and watch it after you know having Bart and you know testimony and, and that it was just it was cool. He asked for a copy of the book. I sent it to his agent. I don't know if he's received it yet, but he hasn't made any comment or hasn't reached out to me. So hopefully one day he will. So because I'd love to know what he thinks of it. So so Bart, if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully he is because that yeah. would be you know that would be huge yeah. for I think both of us. Yeah. Um, just to, for him to know that he's touched lives the way he has. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. You have a part of your book that you'd like to read for us. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to read a section. It's about one of my favorite verses. Um, and it's, it's my, my brother, after he lost his wife, I moved him in with me. And so uh, my prayer time is like three fifteen, three forty five in the morning every day. Um, and Jason got up one day and asked, he said, John, what are you doing? I said, uh, and I told him, and so he started reading, he started getting up with me. And uh, so we used to read, you know, we'd read for a little bit and then we'd pray and we would pop what Scotty, my mentor calls popcorn read. We He'd read a verse, I'd read a verse. And so I'll start off. It, so that's the premise of this. And so I'll, here we go. Um, as we got to Exodus, we were reading in chapter 21 or 20 one morning when it was my turn to read. We were on Exodus 2020. I read it and something hit me. But before I, I but I let it go for the time being later that day. I went back to read it and I read it over and over and I meditated on it for a day. Then it hit me. 
God's message to me was that this is the clear vision of what God wants us to understand, just like 2020 is clear vision when we go to the eye doctor. So what is God's clear vision? This is Exodus 2020. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be in you and will keep you from sinning. Later that day, I started thinking how many verses in the Bible have that address. So I searched. Exodus 2020 is the first in the Bible. There are 16 more, 12 in the Old Testament, four in the New Testament. Ten of them have instructions on how we're to behave and act as Christians. When this verse spoke to me so much that I now have it tattooed on my right forearm. I spent four and a half years in the Marines and didn't get a tattoo, but now I was getting my first tattoo. Um, I left off the first part of the verse because so it would fit on my arm. So Moses said to the people is not a part of the tattoo. The tattoo starts a lot of conversations, and I must admit, I must admit, I love sharing the story and sharing this. I hope that those people will inquire, will inquire about it, and including you. So go look up the verse so that you can understand God's vision. Um, as I was writing this, I was hit by a thought about uh, part of the verse. God has come to test you. God does test us. He tests us to deepen our faith and make and makes us lean into them more and more. So I did another Bible search and I looked at the verses that have the word test in it. There are 35, 21 in the Old Testament, 14 in the New Testament. I would like to think that I have passed the test so far. I have had a few and I know my faith has become deeper because of these. So be ready for your test. It's coming because God wants to know if you love him. So stay, stay faithful during the test and you will be rewarded. That's fantastic. And John, where do people go if they want to grab a copy of your book? They, they can buy it anywhere books are sold. It's, it's, a, all, it's, an e, it's on ebooks, um, or they can visit my website, brokenredeem.com. Um, if they want an autographed copy, the best place would be my website because I'll autograph it and ship it out to you. Awesome. And I do have that link in the description of the podcast as well as uh, different social media places where people can follow you. So I've got your Facebook, your Twitter, and your Instagram, because there's going to be some people that are going to be inspired by you and they're going to want to keep up with you and what it is that you're doing. Um, You're doing incredible things. I hope you're incredibly proud of the person that you've become and the person that God has formed you into. Um, You know, I'm, I'm proud of what God has done for me and where he's put me, but it, it, it's the, I'm just totally humbled by it because if you'd have told me, Three years ago that I would be doing what I'm doing now and preaching the gospel and sharing God's word, I would have laughed at you, (laughs) you know, because I had no idea. You know, it led me to seminary school. I'm eight hours shy of getting my master's in in theology. Oh, that's Um, fantastic. Just because I wanted a deeper understanding of the word. And so, you know, that's where I'm at. So, Oh, my gosh. And and it's all God's doing. And and it's an amazing walk. and, And I can't see I can't wait to see where he takes me next. So. That is amazing, John. And book book two is already in the works. Um, and Ooh. and the little part of my book I read, you should get an idea of what the next book's about. <laughs> Very cool. So. Um, it sounds like I'm going to have an excuse to have you back on my podcast again when that, that book comes out. Absolutely. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one last question that I ask people uh-huh. before I let them go. That's my favorite question ever. What's one thing that you love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? I would say that the, it is the way God has changed my heart and my eyes so that I can see the world through his eyes. Um, because I see the world completely different now. And, and that's what I truly love about my walk with him. Um, and I'm not the same person I was three years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And it's because of his doing it. It's, it's because he's softened my heart and he's given me his eyes to see. That's what I love about it. That's awesome. And I'm going to, I'm going to end this episode with a quote from you that you have on your Facebook page. Okay. God is always with us and he is waiting for us. Yep. I love that. Yep. John, yep. thank you so much for coming on my show today. I, really oh, I, I truly appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. There you're going to find links on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted. 
but I can say that I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune into my other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com.